Hello, my name is Dr. Adam Friedhand. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Texas at UT Ortho. I'm going to be talking to you briefly today about orthopedic robotics. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about this or being examined, I can be uh, your physician at two locations. I see patients actively at Memorial City's campus, the Iron Man Clinic for UT Ortho in Memorial City, and also in Cyprus. So without any further ado, we're going to talk about orthopedic robotics today. What is a robot? In the simplest term, a robot's a machine that's capable of carrying out a complex series of actions automatically and repetitively, especially one that's programmed by a computer. When we talk about uh, robots and their classification, we typically think of them in a couple of different ways. A robot can be a stationary device or a mobile device. So you can see, for example, a drone in the upper left-hand corner of this slide would be considered mobile. And the KUKA arm that you see on the right, which you often see on assembly lines like automobile processing and manufacturing plants is a stationary device. It can also be classified as active or passive and what that means is that an active robot essentially performs its activities without uh, any human uh, interaction. It's typically programmed by a computer and performs those complex interactions on its own. A passive robot typically would require orthopedic, or excuse me, intervention uh, by a human to allow the uh, activities to be performed. I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about Henry Ford because I think the concept of robotics and the assembly line go well together. In 1913, Henry Ford spoke about uh, the assembly line. In fact, he was the inventor of the concept of the assembly line. And the whole idea was to promote efficiency, much like today, the way we do things in our operating rooms. Number one, we place tools and the personnel in a sequence of the operations so that each component uh, shall travel the least possible distance while in the process of finishing. What that means is that we try to do things efficiently in a very sequential and repeatable way. His assembly line utilized work slides or some form of carrier to bring the uh, activity to the workman. So the workman had to move as little as possible and it made the operation efficient and convenient. Using sliding assembly lines uh, by which the parts are to be assembled can be delivered at convenient distances. And basically what this means is that people would be positioned along an assembly line in a staggered fashion such that when the uh, item to be assembled arrived to them, they were ready to perform the uh, sequence of events that were needed to uh, complete their task. And so as a car would be getting manufactured, it would be moving down a line and being assembled piece by piece in a repetitive uh, and, and sequential fashion. The Industrial Revolution is not something that we typically think about in medicine, but if you think about it, there are analogies uh, to what we're experiencing now with orthopedic robotics. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, everything was handmade. People went and did uh, apprentice apprenticeships with master craftsmen, and consequently, uh, the manufactured products varied in quality and in outcome. There was poor quality control. After the Industrial Revolution, most things became man-made. Quality control became much better. The goal, really, with this sort of thing is to minimize human error and to improve safety. In our case, safety for our patients. So why robots? I think it's really interesting to think about uh, the introduction of new technologies, and there's always a period of time where there's skepticism uh, and slow adoption. And certainly, I think, in the world of robotics and medicine, we're kind of in that initial introductory phase. Robots, plain and simply, in terms of industrial manufacturing, have introduced speed, precision, and accuracy, as well as safety, and they don't require experience, they don't get fatigued. They're programmed and they can do a large volume of work in a relatively short period of time. This is introduced in manufacturing world, cost effectiveness and quality control. I put up these two quotes because I think they're interesting. Uh, the first one on the top by Thomas Watson, who was the chairman of IBM, after seeing the first large mainframe computer in 1943, said, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Pretty different if you think about where we are today. And then the one below, Steve Ballmer from Microsoft said, there's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. He said this as soon as 2007. We all have iPhones. I know I do mine sitting right here. Everybody else pretty much has one in their pocket as well. So that period of skepticism often goes away with experience and time.
So what are we trying to fix in orthopedics? I would position to you that simply uh, everything could be improved upon. So historically, we've seen component mechanical failures, uh, orthopedic implants uh, wear over time, and if they're misplaced, uh, meaning not, not uh, installed uh, or placed into the human body properly, they typically fail sooner rather than later. Uh, we've seen product recalls and all kinds of lawsuits in the media. And really the most important thing from the surgeon's perspective is that we want to minimize the risk of surgical complications, decrease human error, and get the best possible outcomes for our patients. This is critically important in the world of knee replacement as it is also in the world for hip replacement. If you look at this slide, some of these numbers are staggering. And I'm not going to go all, through all of them, but you can read them on your own. But I'd just like to highlight a couple of things on this slide. By 2030, total knee replacement procedures are expected to grow over 600, almost 700% to 3.5 million procedures per year. Now, if you look on the right side in the middle, on average, in today's dollars, a knee replacement costs approximately $20,000. Um, interestingly enough, the societal savings is significant, and this can be uh, thought of in terms of people not having pain after their procedures and being productive members of society, being able to get back to work. So a couple of things to think about from this slide is total knee replacement is growing dramatically as time goes on. The cost is uh, enormous uh, to the federal government and to society. However, the savings and the positive impact uh, of total knee replacement is clear. So there's some critical factors for success uh, when doing joint replacement surgery of the hip and the knee, and this involves a couple of things. In terms of manipulating the bone, you want to make sure that you have the proper sized implant because if the implant sizing is not correct, it's not going to work properly. You have to be able to position that implant in the patient's body exactly the way you want it or it potentially will fail prematurely and not work well. The fit and the alignment have to be uh, true to the patient's anatomy because, again, if those things aren't managed properly, the device can fail prematurely. And on the soft tissue side, which is probably uh, even more important, to restore a hip or knee to its normal kinematics, you have to be respectful of the surrounding soft tissues. In the knee, as an example, you need to balance the ligaments in the knee, otherwise the knee will not perform properly. And similarly, if you don't balance the soft tissue structures around a hip, you might be subject to dislocation or there might be leg length discrepancies, things that would create patient dissatisfaction. So what robots are available for us to use in medicine? On the left hand side, you can see uh, something called the Mako surgical robot. That is a product that I uh, have used for a very uh, long number of years, which works for both partial knee replacement total knee replacement and total hip replacement. In the middle, that is the Da Vinci robot. The Da Vinci robot is primarily used uh, for abdominal and pelvic surgery by general surgeons and, and subspecialists in that area. And then on the right-hand side, you can see another type of robot that is used for hip and knee replacement, which is a different sort of uh, orthopedic robot. So, as I stated earlier, we're kind of in this introductory phase where most orthopedic surgeons presently do not use robots. However, uh, there's a tremendous amount of data that is being shared with the orthopedic world. And as each year passes, there's more and more of this data. This uh, slide is already probably a year old or so. And you can see that there's uh, plenty of publications uh, supporting robotic use in orthopedics. Um, if you go to our meetings, the American Academy of orthopedic surgery as an example, or the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons, every year there's more and more presentations on the benefits of robotics in orthopedic joint replacement surgery. And so it's becoming clear through science-based evidence uh, studies that robotics is having a positive impact on hip and knee replacement. So the data shows, if you look at all these things, that there's improved implant position, uh, increased levels of soft tissue protection, decreased failures of the implanted components, and better functional outcomes for the patient. And essentially all these things lead to more satisfied patients, which is what we're all about. I began using partial knee replacement uh, in uh, 2008. Uh, Mako uh, was uh, 
released in 2006 as a partial knee replacement robot and subsequently purchased by Stryker in 2013. A partial knee replacement essentially is a uh, surgical procedure where you selectively replace worn out areas of a joint and leaving normal parts alone. As an example of, of a medial uh, partial knee replacement on the inner aspect of a knee, you would resurface the end of the femur and the top of the tibia, but you would leave all the other critical structures alone. So areas in the knee joint that had normal articular cartilage and normal meniscus, normal cruciate ligaments as an example, those things would be untouched and consequently patients uh, have a better range of motion and better restoration of function uh, when doing uh, this sort of procedure. There are clearly benefits to robots and we've seen this uh, over time and we've seen this in scientific study. It reduces or eliminates surgeon related implantation error because we have enhanced pre-planning that really allows us to know uh, as much uh, about the patient's anatomy uh, before surgery that will help us select uh, the proper size and positioning of the components. It allows us to optimize implant alignment and balance the ligaments and it allows us to retain healthy knee structures which improve natural knee kinematics and subsequently function for the patient. This is just an example of what a partial knee replacement surgical workflow looks like. Uh, we get a CT scan before surgery. Prior to surgery, we actually review a three-dimensional bone model of the patient's uh, own anatomy. That allows us to do this enhanced pre-planning where we really learn uh, in great depth what the patient's anatomy looks like. During surgery, we place arrays or checkpoints on the patient's bones. We register the bone to reconcile our pre-surgical bone model with the intraoperative findings. We then are actually able to uh, balance ligaments uh, through a range of motion uh, procedure that allows us to balance the ligaments prior to doing any bone cutting. So this is an innovation in which prior to making any cuts, we're able to actually optimize the soft tissue envelope around the knee. We can then do adjustments to the components as needed in a live uh, surgical field, and then ultimately cartilage mapping and bone resection to complete the procedure. Total hip replacement uh, was released in 2010, uh, and it's something that I've been doing since then. So I now have about a dozen years of experience using uh, orthopedic robotics. And in short, a, to a total hip replacement essentially is a procedure that replaces the uh, worn out uh, ball and socket joint with an artificial ball and socket joint that consists of four parts. There's a, a socket, which is made out of metal, uh, there's a liner, which is typically made out of plastic, but can also be made out of metal or ceramic. There's a ball that is typically made out of uh, ceramic or metal. And then there's a stem, which is usually made out of uh, titanium alloy. Component malposition in hip replacement are problems that continue to plague uh, surgeons and patients alike. And this can result in leg length discrepancies as well as uh, soft tissue problems such as uh, instability and dislocations. This can result in premature wear. Osteolysis is a term that re uh, reflects the loss of bone secondary to bone resorption. And loosening uh, and litigation can be related to complications surrounding hip replacement surgery. When you use an orthopedic robot to help you with surgery, this is a video that shows what this looks like intraoperatively. You can see the back end of, in the picture in picture of the robotic arm. You can see a glimpse of the side of a surgical wound. And if you look at that picture, you just saw a, a spot of green uh, in the center of the acetabular socket. And that results in the protected removal of bone from that patient's socket. So this is done in a very controlled fashion and is very precise. Total knee replacement came around in uh, 2017. And again, uh, if you look at knee replacement patients, there are issues that continue to plague us, including component malposition, instability, infections. Interesting to note, uh, most of our studies have shown that about 15 to 20% of our patients are unhappy with their replaced knee. And this is unacceptable. That's one in five patients that receives a total knee but's not quite happy with the results that they've obtained. We believe that surgical uh, orthopedic 
robots will help us minimize that number and hopefully drive it as close to zero as possible. Much like the partial knee replacement that I showed you earlier, uh, with total knee replacement, the workflow is very similar. A CT scan is obtained ahead of time. Pre-planning is performed. Intraoperatively, we put these arrays on the patient's bone to allow the robot and the computer to track the bone. We do a bone registration to reconcile that patient's specific anatomy with our pre-plan. We then balance our ligaments and make adjustments to the implant position before we make any cuts. And then we make our cuts, which allow us to deliver a balanced uh, joint with nor as normal knee kinematics as possible. This is a video that shows what it looks like uh, in the surgical theater. You can see on the left-hand side, and this is a sped up video, so I apologize for that, but there's a knee that's in the middle of that surgical field. We're actually able to bring that knee through a range of motion, and you can see all those numbers there that reflect the gaps that help us balance the ligaments in the knee. And so as we make adjustments, we get those gaps equal, and we do that before we make the cuts. When we do a standard knee replacement without uh, orthopedic robotics, typically we make the cuts first and then we figure out the balance afterwards. And so this is, allows us to do less to the soft tissues in a more protected fashion and only cut the bone that is required to get the job done. There's also something called haptic protection. You can see on the right hand side the virtual saw. That saw is captured within that green boundary. So you cannot go outside that boundary and cut structures that are intended to be protected. And that's another feature of uh, this particular procedure. So why technology? We don't do this anymore. I remember, when, actually, I'm old enough now that, that this is how we got around, is by looking at maps. Uh, and you don't want to break out a map and put it on your steering wheel while you're driving or pull over to a rest stop to do this, when in today's day and age, you can do something like this. So almost all cars now have navigation. Not all of them are heads up like this, but you have navigation on your phone. A lot of cars have navigation on their dashboard. And this is a technological innovation that makes our lives safer, simpler, and easier to navigate, if you will. Robotics has many advantages. Uh, it allows us to do an advanced surgical pre-planning. It allows us to machine bone very precisely. It allows us to improve the placement of the components in the human body. And it allows us, in a sense, to know what the result is going to be before we leave the operating room. So what are we doing at UT Ortho? Well, we have a number of robot sites and, and some of my partners that you've seen in some of our previous videos are at these sites, such as the Woodlands, such as at Memorial Hermann Orthopedic and Spine Hospital here at Memorial City. We're doing partial knee replacements, total knee replacements, and total hip replacements. We run uh, surgical education out of the Siri Lab downtown, which is Surgical Innovations and Robotic Institute, where we do a lot of uh, surgical training. And we train residents and fellows to use the, the latest and greatest technologies such as orthopedic robotics. So people often ask, are robots here to stay? And I believe the answer is clearly yes. You know, prior to this robotic surgical revolution, surgeons, very much like apprentices, went to residents, uh, residency programs, got their training on conventional instruments, and the variation in quality and outcomes uh, were fairly broad. Now, with robots, we have more precision and accuracy. I think we can control the quality of our surgical procedures to a greater degree. We do this in an effort to minimize surgical error, and I think we're delivering consistently better patient outcomes with these technologies, and I think some of the early publications are bringing this to bear. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoyed that uh, talk on robotics. How much time is that? They can edit that in.